forward to this. Greatly looking forward to this. Okay, so let's get started now. It's uh, okay. All right. Yeah. PR. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the Space Science webinar series uh, hosted by the Center for Space Science at NYU Abu Dhabi in collaboration with the UAE Space Agency. Our today's speaker is Dr. Jose Antonio Rodriguez Manfredi. He's the head of the Department of Space Instrumentation at the Spanish Astrobiology Center, CAB, which is a part of the National Institute of Aerospace Technology, INTA, as well as the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC. Uh, he has been in, uh, involved with uh, the NASA's uh, Curiosity mission. He uh, was involved with one of the instruments. He's the principal investigator of the MEDA uh, experiment on board NASA's Perseverance mission, which is currently on its way to Mars. Uh, he's also the PI of the TWINS experiment, which is on board the NASA's InSight mission which measures temperature and uh, wind on, and it is currently uh, operating on the surface of Mars. Uh, so Jose, welcome again to our center and uh, the stage is all yours. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Demetra, for this kind of invitation. It's a real pleasure uh, to share this, this minutes with you and talk about uh, Perseverance, uh, Meta, our instrument, and uh, just a little about the next steps, what's beyond the, uh, those missions we're now sending to Mars. Uh, but let, let me start uh, from the beginning. You can, you can see my screen, right? Uh, yes, okay. So uh, this may seem really obvious to the audience, but uh, what do we go to Mars? Why is this planet so uh, fascinating to scientists, uh, technologists, uh, space agencies, and, and the general public? Uh, well, I, I think the, the eagerness to, to explore uh, is intrinsic to our genetic code, but beyond that point, Mars raises many questions that, that we're trying to answer. Uh, questions just like, uh, was or is, who knows, Mars an abode for life? Uh, we know that Mars is right at the limit. The limit is uh, not uh, uh, a fixed line, but anyway, we're, uh, Mars is and the limit of the habitable zone for our sun. And uh, so it may, at some point in the past, it has some good conditions, but was able life to survive, to, to emerge first and then uh, evolve on those conditions? In case it didn't, why not? So Mars is, is making us think about the possibilities of the emergence of life, not only in the universe, uh, but well, I mean, not only in the solar system, but also in the universe. Of course, Mars is also a way to, uh, to, to understand how our Earth, our planet may evolve in the future by means of uh, different uh, competitive studies we may do between the two planets. Uh, we know Mars has a huge and great uh, climate change that is, uh, of course, what is driving the dynamic, the, the, the geological and the, uh, well, the, the Mars, the, the planet, entirely planet dynamics. And is that change also possible in our case? What can we learn out of this? So as you see, Mars is providing a lot of different questions that we, we can also apply to Earth. And uh, of course, in the future, maybe in the near future, is Mars or can Mars be considered a destination for humanity? Uh, can we live on that? Mars is, in quote, accessible. Uh, this is not the, the, uh, the, the closest planet, but anyway, it is uh, easy. Uh, to, to get in there. And who knows, the astronauts may be walking on its surface in a uh, few years, who knows? I think uh, we say, typically say the, uh, the astronaut, the first astronaut stepping over the Martian surface uh, was already born. So 
who knows, probably one of you in the audience may be the uh, first astronaut on the surface of Mars. But uh, Mars today, at least on, on its surface, does not have the characteristics of the habitable environment uh, we initially thought about. It is much too cold, too dry, and it receives uh, quite intense bombardment by energetic radiation from the sun. So at the moment, uh, we don't know uh, life for, on Earth that could survive those conditions. For, for example, uh, even at the, um, the Martian equator, the temperatures may drop below minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius every now, every night, every night. So uh, Mars conditions are really arid, so really, really arid. Uh, but it wasn't always this way. Um, over the years, over the uh, decades, humanity has sent missions to Mars to study the planet, to understand its dynamic process, its characteristics, and to learn uh, from it, as we said. Uh, by, by the way, uh, the space race to Mars is uh, full of uh, successful missions and achievements, but also failures. You have here in the screen, you have a list. This is not updated because uh, we have three more on the way, uh, not counted on this list. Uh, hopefully, um, by the end of the year, once it's, uh, the mission stops, arriving on Mars in, in February, when Perseverance get in there, I will update that with the three, these three more. But anyway, we've sent, uh, we've, we've sent uh, 45, almost 50 missions up to now to Mars. Uh, those missions, you can see the list, started on 1960, so a long time ago. And from that time, we started uh, not only uh, maturing the technology that now is uh, used, uh, of course, uh, the evolution of those uh, early technologies to get on Mars. Um, so that, that, that process from those uh, 1960s uh, to now, have provide a lot of information about the technologies and about the, the planet itself. Uh, by the way, the technology has been evolving, uh, as you can imagine, from small, quite a small vehicles like the one you see in the, in the screen. Uh, that is, the, the, small, the smallest one is the Pathfinder with the, uh, the Sojourner uh, rover that NASA sent in 1997. Uh, up to now, we've seen a, a huge evolution in that technology and the capability to land on Mars. We will talk about that capability and those needs uh, in, in, a, in a minute or two. So you can see how uh, the capability we have to land on Mars, one, and two, being able to um, to get the knowledge through the instruments we send, the more and more complex uh, instrument we send is increasing exponentially. But anyway, even if we're able to send this kind of uh, huge vehicles, this, uh, this one on the, on the left is Curiosity. And uh, well, by, by the way, Perseverance is more or less the same size. It's a little, a little bigger, but anyway, same concept, more or less. Uh, Perseverance is uh, probably the most complex system humanity, in this case, NASA, has been able to launch and hopefully land on Mars. But even though we're talking about one tone, just 1,000 kilos, just that, this is not, this is not, enough if we want to really get the mass of the planet. One tone, 1,000 kilos is huge. And, if, and of course, this is a huge problem to land at on Mars. But anyway, we need more. We need to eventually be able to, uh, to send up uh, an astronaut to the surface to really get the mass of the planet with a, even with a minimum set of uh, instruments. So the capability uh, an astronaut, uh, well-trained astronaut or set of astronauts can 
study and can uh, dig into that scenario and investigate the planet will be never compared with, with the capability we can get with the, the functionalities we can get with the, with, the, with the rover. So the future will need to uh, we'll need to put a human on the surface of Mars or whatever other planet to finally get the mass of the uh, of that planet to investigate and really understand what is what is going on in there. So with this uh, technologies over the years, uh, we've been able to learn a lot about the planet, not only from the orbit but also from from the surface. We now uh, know that. Uh, you can see here uh, this uh, comparison between the, the planets and um, how, how different these are. Uh, I want to uh, turn your attention to some uh, figures I have in here because that is really um, conditioning uh, and uh, limiting the, the technology we can send in there. Uh, the pressure is quite low the order of one percent of the the pressure the atmospheric pressure we have here on earth uh the temperatures are far under uh the uh zero degrees so we're talking about minus 70 or minus 60 as an average and uh, we also have uh an atmosphere that is mostly co2 about 98 99 percent the atmosphere is co2 and in that condition uh, together with the huge winds we're able to to i mean we've been able to measure in there i'm talking about 150 170 uh, uh, meters per second meter per meters per second um we have dust storms we have uh, clouds we have uh uh, we have a quite active uh, atmosphere, uh, atmospheric environment. So, oh well, by the way, we also know that uh, Mars doesn't have a global um, magnetic field. Uh, that the, the, the magnetic field we keep, we've been able to measure in there is mostly local because of the permanent uh, magnetization of some rocks that is about 10 times or so, uh, the, the, I mean, under the uh, in very, very tiny magnetization. But anyway, with InSight, with the, with the mission, uh, with the recent missions we've sent, we've been able to, to adjust that, that knowledge we have to correct that knowledge and update it because uh, the, the, the magnetization is uh, about 10 times the magnetization we initially thought because of, uh, I mean, uh, from the measurements we were able to take uh, from orbit. So this is not as tiny as we thought, but anyway, this is almost negligible compared with the magnetization uh, we have uh, here on Earth. So uh, we know Mars is nowadays very arid. We, uh, we know it is cold and bleak, as we said, but we have some uh, important questions uh, to, to answer. Uh, for example, the great questions uh, about the, the climate change we mentioned, and, and even better, uh, how was it ever possible to sustain liquid water on, on the surface uh, on, on, on Mars? We know that. Uh, Something is missing here to really understand, uh, to really understand that planetary uh, changes in general. Uh, very briefly, the volcanic activity is, or probably was the main driver uh, that caused this problem. Essentially, the, the volcanic activity began to decrease in the middle of the Esperian age, and as the planet be, uh, began to cool down, uh, which, which Cause the uh, a fewer emanations from from the from the volcanoes, uh, so they uh, these emanations uh, usually compensate what was lost to the open um, space because of the uh, smaller gravity the planet has, and so all that causes the magnetic field to decrease, 
which in short allows the solar wind to, to drag more, uh, most of the atmosphere. So as a loop, the planet started cooling down. Uh, so the magnetic field started uh, uh, ramping down in, in its intensity. And so the solar wind started dragging the atmosphere that was more and more exposed to that. So everything together caused that problem, that, that, that change in the climate of the planet. The initially, we're estimating that in 3.6 billion years ago, more or less, was that, uh, that way you see in your screen, a wet and uh, a wet planet with, with uh, huge uh, oceans. And now uh, we have to put that, all that in context with, with the, the current approaches we have. So uh, the, uh, the beginning of that exploration um, program, those exploration programs we were mentioning, uh, the scientists and the agencies uh, were focused more, mostly focused on understanding the geology, of the planet. But now, especially over the last decade, uh, the agencies have been focused on, on, on life, on the potential life on Mars. Studying also the climate and the geology as a site, uh, we uh, forgot about that, but having life as the, may, the, the, the main driver for the, for the exploration in general. All those linked through the water, the only, um, the 100% uh, cases we have here on Earth uh, of the life form are based on water. So for us, water and follow the water is the, uh, the, 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 the sentence that may summarize this approach. Uh, looking for the water is a good driver, is a good proxy to, to look for life uh, in next steps. So instead of investigating, uh, you know, blindly investigating the planet, we try to identify the deposits or the major activities of water on the surface to go there and go deeper in this investigation. So for us, water is one of the most important drivers in the, um, in the study of, of Mars. Uh, after the water, the habitability is the step beyond, meaning that, okay, we have water, but the water may be in different conditions, not only applicable to life or, or to habitable uh, uh, environments. The liquid, to become that scenario, that potential landscape into an habitable one has to be in um, a, in liquid form, not in water vapor or in, in form on ice. So it has to be in liquid form. It has to be uh, it has to has a neutral pH more or less with uh, not so high or not so low um, salinic activity. And so everything together will finally provide a comfortable scenario for life. That is the habitability beyond the, the water I was, I was mentioning. So on curiosity, uh, one of the most important goals was to study the, the uh, particular, uh, those particular characteristics. And finally, we uh, uh, got the surprise that Mars was really habitable. Which of course does not mean Mars was inhabited. So Mars was habitable means that Mars in the past, probably 3.8, 3.5 million year, billion, billion years ago, Mars has a condition to eventually provide uh, a scenario in which life could emerge and eventually survive. So this is the key point here. Mars was habitable, which is not meaning inhabited, is something that is the, um, causing the new missions to, to, to move forward now, looking for, for those life forms. And this is, back to the previous slide, this is 
the next step in the planetary in the Martian in the Martian exploration. Now that we know that Mars was habitable, why don't we try to look for those potential life life forms? Uh, at the moment, these missions we're now working on will search for uh, for evidence of life. The mission doesn't include into its uh, into its um, objectives into its goal uh, the look uh, the seek for life forms. What we're looking for is for evidence of past life forms or, if any, present life forms. Uh, evidences. That's the, that's key for the for understanding the international and overall strategy uh, of Mars exploration. And one important uh, aspect I don't want to forget is how human, how the uh, the potential human exploration, or as we said, considering Mars as a destination is in the far objective beyond all these missions. So sending humans to Mars is not easy, is not trivial. And most of the agencies are now working <clears throat> on preparing the technology that human crew may need in the future by testing and maturing that technology there on Mars, not here on our labs not here on our um, most representative scenarios. NASA, in this particular case, is developing new technologies and want to prove the uh, usability, uh, the, um, uh, the um, affordability there on Mars, on the real environment, the human crew will need to survive. And this is also one of the most important objectives perseverance, perseverance has. <clears throat> but back to the uh, seeking for, for uh, life, we know that at some level, some degree, Mars and Earth evolved, evolved uh, parallelly. But at some point, something happened and it started diverging one from the other. Here, <clears throat> we know that, uh, well, we, we can go to the field, depending on the cases, but we can find fossils. We can find fossils of uh, uh, mammals or, or, in general, uh, animals or, or uh, life forms. But we cannot, we should not look for the same, uh, evidences on Mars. On Mars, as we said before, had a, uh, Mars had a huge climate change uh, about, you say here, billion years ago that diverged from the trajectory uh, both planets have. So if we had to compare in some sense what kind of life we can expect to find on Mars, we should go here on Earth, we should go to those places where those, those uh, biological activity happen at the same time we're now uh, pointing out on Mars. So in that case, we should go to those places on Earth, mainly, uh, well, you can see those, uh, those places in gray where 3.5 billion years, we have evidence of that terrestrial life. On Mars, uh, we have, we have a, a larger record of those rocks uh, that age. Uh, more that uh, the rocks we have here on Earth because of the evolution of our planet. So in some sense, the evolution of, of our planet has been hiding or not masking, but altering those terrain, those terrains, uh, those rocks uh, from, from those 3.5 billion years ago. So in that sense, we can say that uh, Mars offers uh, a unique window into what a habitable planet in its infancy looks like. 
Uh, so when we try to look for some places here on earth, we should go to those places in gray, as you say, uh, as you see in the screen, uh, to, to, to design the strategies, to design the technology, to mature that, that technology that eventually will send to Mars, we're sending actually, we're sending to Mars looking for those lives, if you understand. So in that case, uh, we should look for not this classical uh, or classic fossils uh, from less than uh, uh, 600 uh, million years ago. We should look for something like this, this kind of microbial biosignatures uh, we can see on, on Pilbara in Australia. That's the kind of evidence we're looking for on Mars, or we'll look for on Mars uh, next year, maybe. These are um, the stromatolites uh, produced by, by uh, microbial mats growing on, on muddy surfaces in shallow water. So if Mars have those conditions, probably we'll be able to find something like this. And so hopefully again, we'll be able if uh, this uh, material, if, this, if those uh, microbial um, uh, fossils have been uh, well preserved, we'll be able to find them. But, but anyway, as I was saying, uh, as for now, what we can say is that Mars was habitable. And that's the, that's the goal, uh, one of the most important goals beyond uh, perseverance. Perseverance, uh, or NASA in general wants to, to contribute to this detailed study with, uh, with, the, with this mission, with the, with the mission that is now on its way to Mars. So in that sense, we, we have to understand perseverance as the next step, at least from NASA's perspective, of course, in this process of understanding the, the planet, uh, understanding its dynamic, and in that case, uh, going into the details of the, of the particular objectives it has, uh, the science objective um, overarching the possibilities of life on, on, on Mars, as I'm saying here, is uh, the first one is the study, the, the geology, uh, carrying out an integrated set of context, contact, and especially coordinated measurements to characterize uh, the, the geology of the landing site we're going to, um, studying uh, the history and the origin and uh, how and why this uh, rocks uh, and soil was formed uh, in the, in the uh, delta uh, we're going to land on. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, the, second, the second objective uh, pertains to, to in situ astrobiology. Uh, we want to, to find and characterize those uh, evidences, those uh, characteristics, those features of the ancient habitable environment, identifying those uh, rocks uh, with the highest, uh, highest chances to, to preserve the sign of the ancient Martian life. And of course, if these uh, were present, uh, seek for the signs of life uh, on, those, on those environments. Uh, the third, the third objective uh, is to to uh, collect samples, to place rigorously documented and selected samples in some uh, uh, receptacles, in in some uh, returnable sample caches uh, for for possible return to Earth in the future. That's uh, why we say the Perseverance mission is the first the first step in sending back to Earth. Uh, those samples as part of the mass sample return. So this is the first, uh, this mission, Mars 2020 Perseverance is the first step in the, um, in the Mars sample return program. And uh, well, as uh, we said before, uh, the fourth objective is to start working, start preparing for, for human exploration, text, uh, testing uh, new technologies for, for, for that purpose. So uh, one of the most important 
um, one of the most important uh, agents in the atmosphere that may, not may, that drives uh, one of the most important roles is the, the dust. Uh, dust, as we'll see, uh, dust may affect the, the, um, uh, the technology, the instruments that will get the oxygen out of the um, CO2 atmosphere. So having a perfect, well, not perfect, but a good understanding uh, of how the dust is lifted, how uh, the, the dust cycle is behaving, how the dust particles are um, in general, how the dust behaves, that is crucial and that will be crucial for designing new missions. New missions uh, far beyond the, the one tone, uh, one, one uh, thousand kilos we were mentioning. Imagine a mission like, uh, I don't know, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you know uh, the movie The Martian, uh, just as a, a way to, to depict, briefly depict a potential habitable module where uh, the astronaut has to live on. Uh, so that is quite heavy. So imagine how many, uh, how many uh, trips, one tone trips we have to send to Mars to finally have the habitable module uh, all together to finally send a, 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 an astronaut to there. So if that is a problem for one tone, for a one tone mission, uh, larger missions will even, uh, create more complexity, will be even more complex to land. And so the dust, the, the understanding of the dust and the atmosphere will be crucial to, to understand, I mean, to, to being able to land that. And uh, for, for that purpose, uh, Perseverance has a number of uh, instruments, seven instruments, actually. One of, one of them is the uh, the mass cam Z. This is a multispectral uh, spectroscopic uh, imager that is able to to zoom in and out to you know to uh, extend our vision uh, of the landscape without moving there. This mission, together with uh, this, this instrument, together with SuperCam, which is a remote optical. Uh, a spectroscopy, a spectroscopy um, an instrument uh, that is able to to uh, uh, use a laser together with the capability to to zoom in to to fire some rocks, make some context uh, study without moving the rover. So the capability to to make the context science without moving the rover will be essential to get the most of the, of the scenario, not needing to move to particular rocks to uh, finally analyze them. But in any case, if needed, uh, we'll, after analyzing the, the surrounding area with those, uh, with those instruments, with the, with the uh, zoomed uh, camera and uh, with mask and Z and with the laser one, the, the spectroscopy instrument, if we find something interesting, we will go to that and then we'll perform some contact science with the instrument Pixel and Sherlock that are uh, uh, placed in the, in the arm, in the huge arm it has. So uh, Pixel is, um, is a, an X-ray spectrometer uh, devoted for uh, the uh, light of chemistry and uh, Sherlock is a Raman and Lives uh, instrument for both of them to characterize the, the organic, the chemical, the chemicals and organics in the samples. Both of them are a, a same in the, in the arm and uh, will characterize with uh, the spectroscopy technique, the samples, I'm sorry, the, the rocks and or the soil, we can, uh, we can decide based on the information from the other two instruments I was mentioned. Uh, Sherlock also has another uh, feature, another capability that is uh, as a, a microscope. This is a wide angle uh, sensor 
microscope that will be able to to look in detail into those samples, those soil samples or, or, or rocks. So all together, we'll be able to get the moss in different um, bands, UV, uh, and, and infrared in some cases, and different spectroscopy techniques. And hopefully working together, we will analyze those stromatolite-like uh, samples we, we saw before to study the ancient microbial mass. Uh, this is something really challenging and, and we, as you can imagine, we can't wait to see what they can find on Mars. Uh, also, Perseverance has a, um, this is a ground penetrator, crater, something like that, an imager uh, to analyze the subsurface to, to, uh, to monitor the structure, the internal structures we may have under the Martian surface. And even if we have some water deposits or, or uh, well, different, different structures under the surface, the signal, the signals, uh, the imager, uh, the radar imager will take, will change depending on, on what materials and uh, what materials are present on the ground. And so if it is ice or rock or sand or liquid water, we can get a, a signature of that. And so uh, understand what context, not, not only on the surface, but also on the sur surface we have in there. Um, one more instrument is, this is not actually an instrument. This is a demonstrator, uh, is uh, MOXIE. Uh, I was uh, referring before, we were discussing before the, uh, the goal NASA has to, to test uh, technologies uh, that will eventually be crucial for the future missions, uh, the human missions. This is an example. MOXIE is, uh, is what we call uh, an ISRU instrument uh, and will get the oxygen out of the atmosphere, or the CO2 in the atmosphere. So it is a, an in situ resource utilization uh, in the IESRU uh, experiment to extract that oxygen of that. As, as I was saying, this is a demonstration. This is a demonstrator and it's not expected to work for the entire mission. It will have some special periods to test uh, its performance, MOXIE performance, um, based on changes in conditions or or dust to, to essentially to, to analyze the impact that dust may uh, play on the efficiency of that. Uh, but, but, but again, this is a demonstrator. This is not uh, uh, focusing a particular, uh, it is not focusing a particular science object in the mission. Um, and together with all that uh, meta or instrument is the instrument, actually this is a suite of, of sensors. Sensors uh, designed to, to characterize the environment, not only the weather. We say <clears throat> META is beyond a weather station because it is able to measure different magnitudes, different magnitudes that are not classic, classically considered as part of the weather, sorry, weather, weather uh, <clears throat> understanding. So radiation um, that may play an important role on on life, on the life forms in there. Uh, of course, the, the winds, the pressure, the relative humidity, the temperature in general, the radiation, the radiation balance coming from the sun are also being reflected by the, by the soil, uh, by, the, by the ground, will be, uh, so all those objectives are a part of our investigation. But uh, in addition to, to that uh, environmental characterization, Meta will focus on, on understanding that those uh, DAS properties, as we were saying, because of the impact that may have on the other sensors or, or instruments like MOXIE. And uh, so it will, it will provide valuable information to really understand that environmental, those environmental DAS properties. Uh, I'm talking about the total column, the uh, the size distribution in, in the column, the, the phase functions. Uh, and so um, we'll be characterizing all those magnitudes uh, in diurnal to seasonal cycles. So uh, understand how 
the uh, did that within a soul, within a Martian day, it varies in the atmosphere, for example, or how the winds or the humidity or all those magnitudes will be, uh, will be changing uh, within a few hours, especially the dust, how the dust is, uh, is gonna change and is affected uh, by other uh, environmental weather, uh, meteorological magnitudes, conditions uh, will be also um, especially important to understand how, how the, the temporal response is happening here. And so META is actually uh, a set of sensors spread over the rover, looking for the best place on it to, to measure uh, that particular magnitude. Uh, as you can imagine, that, that was an important challenge because, uh, so you see, if you see my cursor, this uh, part, this element in the rear part of the rover is the, the RTG, the, ra the radio isotope generator that is powering the, all the systems in it. Uh, this RTG, uh, that's the way we call it, the RTG increases the temperature by 180 degrees. Uh, the, the, it increases the temperature, the surrounding temperature about that. So you can imagine how hard it is to measure the temperature uh, 1.5 meters more or less uh, far from, from this heater. Uh, so we have to combine different elements, uh, different, different inform the information by different sensors, for example, the wind, and analyze if the wind is, for example, throwing the thermal plume uh, the RTG generates into one sensor or another, and so how that may be affected. To do that, we have different elements, different elements to, uh, to finally, different detectors, let's say, different detectors to, to finally um, subtract, let's say, that effect out of the retrieval. Let me give you an example. So uh, you see, well, probably don't see that, but we have three air temperature sensors on the mast, and the mast I'm, I'm uh, trying to, uh, uh, to move with my track, with my, with my cursor. So we have three sensors here and two more of the lower part of the rover body. So if the wind is coming from the rear and then throwing the thermal plume to these three on the mast, uh, this three may be in the free flow not affected or less affected. So combining all that information will be able to provide this in this case is the temperature, but a similar approach for the winds and other magnitudes. So we can measure those meteorological or environmental magnitude, magnitudes as if we wouldn't have the rover on the surface. So the rover is, as you can imagine, the most important uh, perturbance on the environment. So our goal is to finally provide those magnitudes, magnitudes as if we don't have the rover in it. So this is a challenge, of course. So um, very briefly, we have uh, developed some, some uh, particular technologies to survive those uh, extreme conditions, the radiation, mainly because, well, uh, META is uh, an environmental uh, meteorological, if you want, station. We have to be exposed to that atmosphere, to that, to that, to that environment. And so the radiation, the, uh, the temperature, the lowest temperature, everything that makes Mars extreme will impact on that, will have a, a, an impact on that. So META has been designed to survive those conditions and well, to be able to measure uh, 24 hours a day with a minimum power draw to provide you know, those magnitudes that will eventually uh, provide that information. And will also be used to, to validate the models, the meteorological models, the dynamic models, the uh, uh, radiative transfer models, the photochemical models. So with our team, we'll have to do a um, uh, huge effort to combine all that information on Earth and so uh, validate those models. So you can see here in that, in that video, you've seen how the wind sensor two that was initially folded uh, will deploy after landing, and so uh, get out uh, at a minimum, get out of the therm of the of the geometrical influence, and measure the wind uh, with a minimum impact. 
uh, you've seen, you, you can see here the different, the different sensors Meta has. Uh, the one you have on your top left is the Meta computer. Uh, that is a special one because we, we have to keep measuring even when the rover is sleeping. So we have to have a capability to operate on Mars in some sense independently on the rover. Uh, so you can see here some some pictures, and this is this is a this is a, a video that shows uh, how the sampling and caching system will work. This is one of the most important systems in this in the mission, and is able not only to take the samples out of the rock but also encapsule those samples on some kind of vessels. Uh, Thirty five samples will be collected in general, total mass of about uh, half a kilo or something like that. And, and so in the future, we'll be able to bring it, bring them to, to, uh, to Earth and so study, uh, uh, de determine the, the, the potential biosignatures on this, to study the geochronology, the, the history, the formation of those samples, and uh, also to, to, to study the, 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 the Mars uh, climate change as we say. Uh, we also have in Perseverance uh, another technology demonstrator that is uh, this helicopter, this drone that will prove the capability we may have to, to fly something. This is quite a small, uh, no payload, it's just, if we are able to fly that, it will be it, it will be proved that we can fly something heavier than air on the surface of other planets, and that will be crucial as well for the for the future missions. It will be uh, attached to the belly pan of the rover, and eventually, when we land, uh, it'll drop. It will drop it, uh, and so we'll we'll rearm and then and then fly. Where are we going to Mars? I'm just about to finish. Where do we go to Mars? We're, we're going to Jezero Crater. That is a, a very interesting place. This is a, 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 a river uh, delta, a delta and a river uh, that eventually has been moving uh, interesting material and exposing that to the, the system. And so our, our plan is to find there uh, good conditions with no need to dig into the surface. So the river has been doing its job, moving the materials, uh, also uh, providing uh, wetness to the environment. And so we think that this is one of the best possible places to, with a minimum, uh, with a minimum uh, capability to, to dig into the surface, we can access to those ancient uh, soils. And eventually, if possible, if this had been preserving the, the sign of life, we'll be able to find it. Uh, so but we've, seen, we've seen the, the most, one of the most important one is the capability to, to sample and to cache those, those rocks to finally bring it back. And uh, this is actually the future. The near future is the uh, Mars Sample Return mission. This is a, a, a mission between NASA and NISA and is planning to, um, we say, uh, to gather some, some samples, to, to fetch and gather some samples that in the new uh, decade or so will be, will be fetched and gathered by another rover that will use a, a kind of rocket to put it in orbit. And a third part of the mission will uh, have a kind of rendezvous will gather those samples and will bring them to Earth. If everything goes as expected, that will happen in the next uh, 12 years or so, if, if everything, if every step is getting taxes. So probably in 2030, 30-ish, we may have some Martian rocks here. And all together with the preparation for the human exploration, we'll will give us a, an important and amazing uh, opportunity to get out of our country, uh, for, uh, from our planet, get out of our planet, and so understand and look for other 
you know, as scenarios where we eventually will uh, find uh, light forms. This is uh, one of the, uh, the biggest questions we have on this. And uh, in my opinion, we're not that far for getting an answer, a positive answer to that, but we'll, we'll see in the future. Uh, so thank you so much for, for your time. I'm, I'm sorry I uh, ran over four minutes out of the time we have. Thank you, Nita. Oh, that was great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jose. I am clapping on behalf of the audience. Yeah, thank you, Jose. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. So let us start with uh, Q&A. Please use the Q&A feature or raise your hand. Uh, Srini, do you have any question? No, no, this was uh, wonderful. Yeah, Jose, can you go to the chat section? There is a question. Uh, so the question is, do you know how the drone will work given the lift issues in the low atmospheric pressure conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this, is, uh, this is a demonstrator and is not steady to fly long distances. Uh, in, the, in the design of the drone, it has uh, larger uh, blades, as you can imagine. We're talking about uh, one, 1 1.1 meter each. So in, in general, uh, on Earth, it will have to, it doesn't need to have those larger, uh, so, so large, so large blades. It has 1.1 1 .1, uh, to, to get the, that kind of buoyancy. We need to, to, to fly this light but in any case, heavier than air um, uh, drone like this. In addition to that, it has to spin about five to seven times faster than a classical drone uh, uh, we need to do here on Earth to 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 live the same the same uh, weight. So the the plan is to uh, in the first stage to study. Of the environment, together with uh, and with the help of Meta, with the support of Meta, and determine the most convenient conditions, especially the wind. Uh, and after loading the batteries, it will it will uh, uh, perform some uh, few um, hovering flights, few seconds. Uh, that might be about sixty to ninety seconds, just that. So just to prove the capability, we have to lift that body into the atmosphere. And after that, it will try to eventually, if everything works as expected, it will try to fly some meters far beyond the, the, uh, the departure position. But it's just that. I mean, it is not uh, a plan to, to fly for long distances. It has some cameras, uh, high cameras, uh, high resolution cameras pointing down way, it has a, a, minimum, a minimum system a gyroscope and a visual odometer, uh, but that's that just that. It is not um, intended to be, uh, to, to go beyond that point. All right. Yeah, next question from Axel Brandenburg. Uh, are there any plans on a follow-up of the label release experiment, which was done on Viking 1 and 2? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Didn't hear that? Yeah, so uh, as you know, the Viking 1 and 2 uh, mission had the label uh -huh. release experiment mm -hmm. to detect mm -hmm. signs of life. Is there mm -hmm. any plan to do a follow-up on that? Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, that experiment on the Vikings were really controversial. And uh, so that is actually why this is part of the, well, this is part of the, um, the overall program to, to look for sign. In this case, to prevent from having the same problem, uh, the plan is to analyze those samples, those uh, rocks or soil with the instrument we've seen. And in case of a good candidate, it will be cast to, to analyze those samples here. So the, the Perseverance rover just have the spectrometer the spectrometers in general 
we've seen, the cameras and the, uh, and well, those uh, radars. Does it have other kind of uh, biological experiments as uh, we used to have with the Vikings? So everything will have to be confirmed here on Earth with the samples we'll bring back. Yeah, that was a bit surprising for me because uh, I was hoping to have a more complex uh, organic chemistry analysis experiment or something like that, an upgrade of a MoMA experiment or something like that. But it wasn't there, so it looks like they just want to uh, have the cash and then get it back to Earth for analysis for now. Yeah. That's absolutely right. But well, you know this uh, uh, famous sentence by Carl Sagan say uh, something like, um, amazing conclusions need uh, uh, amazing proofs, or I don't remember exactly the wording, but the, the point was that, and be because of that, uh, the community wants to be really cautious on, on this. So if we finally, if we're finally able to find those, those evidence, uh, of life on Mars, we'll need to confirm that. We cannot claim success on that because of the importance and the nature of the question. Uh, we cannot claim success uh, if we don't, if we, if we had a minimum doubt and whatever technique, especially on the surface of other planet, uh, may have some, you know, vague results that may hide or match in some sense the nature. So, this is, this is really serious, we understand that. And the solution we provide with, with having another mission that goes uh, and gathers the, the, the samples and bring it back, that is quite complex. But this particular question deserves that kind of, uh, that, that kind of response in NASA's perspective, of course. Right. All right, if there are no more questions, then let us uh, thank Jose once again. Thank you, Jose. Uh, that was thank great. you. It's been a uh, great pleasure you, being with you. See you all uh, next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you all. Bye. Okay, I'll sign off, Dimitra. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.